Welcome to Silver Lane Baptist Sunday School, 10 a.m. this morning. We hope you're watching on live stream, and uh, we're excited about what God has for us today. And uh, let's stand and sing something first. All right, let's all stand and let's turn to 685. I've got a mansion. We'll sing one verse. Again. $6 worth of pennies. 
and so that you get a, for five dollars you get a brick that weighs as much as six dollars and pennies. You get a gold brick. We get a bunch of gold bricks around here. And uh, but anyway, we put them in there. And sometimes it takes four buckets to hold all that we got. But I don't know if I have as many of this because we're not we're not really uh, we're we're trying to fly a little bit under the radar. I guess is what I'm trying to say for our kids and any of the kids that you know personally. Uh, so tonight we're going to have the uh, Bible Club meeting, and if you can help out in any way, it's just not this Monday, but the following week, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. It's three nights, 6.30 to 8. It's, we're shortening it a half hour. I want it to be an hour and a half, but I call it an uh, hour and a half of insanity. Uh, <laughs> we always have a good time. Uh, I thought this was interesting. This was on... Uh, Last August, uh, this was in the bulletin, uh, Brother Gates will be visiting the area Wednesday, August 25th through Saturday, August 28th. He is praying, seeking about God's will. They have been missionaries in Egypt since 2010. They have ministered in Egypt and are not able to go back. They also have a son with special needs. They are praying about moving here to the Dearborn Heights area and ministering to Muslims. They both speak Arabic, Brother and Mrs. Gates, and have won Egyptians to Christ, disciple them, train them, and even establish the word. So praise pray about that. So we've got an answer to prayer. Amen. Here they are. Amen. They live on Edgewood Street, and uh, they've got their kids with them, and, and uh, uh, they're, they're moved in. Is there anything else you guys need? I think you got everything in the house set up. Amen. Just prayer. Just and, place, a lot of prayer. And... Uh, He's, uh, Brother uh, uh, Gates has already been working with George and Selma that usually come at least uh, on Sundays. And uh, so their possibility will be meeting with them during the services. And we've also opened up the mission house if they need to use the mission house for like, like different class for men and for women. So you pray about that. And really, the... Uh, the Vacation Bible School or the Bible Club is one of the ways we reach out to uh, Middle Eastern families because they'll bring. We, we, we've had many kind of head coverings and everything come to Vacation Bible School to see what we're doing. And of course, they want all the free food, the free candy, the free prizes. So uh, uh, if you have some neighbors like that, that would be good if you could invite them. All right, uh, don't forget, this Saturday is the men's prayer breakfast. And Brother... Uh, Brother Ms. Dante's are not feeling well today, and you pray for them. Uh, but we will be having the men's prayer breakfast. You'll sign up for it to help with, let us know how many to set up for uh, Saturday, August 14th at 9 a.m. And I appreciate the men to come here at 8.30 and then 9.30 to pray. We have men to come before the prayer meeting to pray. Isn't that a blessing? Yeah, amen. Uh, so the Bible Club is 17, 18, and 19. Not this week, but next week. Oh. And our Silvery Lane uh, Bible Institute will be starting Monday, August 31st, and we'll go uh, from 6 to 7 p.m. We've got tentatively, we're going to go every other week, but there's a sign-up sheet because I need to know how many are coming and to get uh, have, have information for you and the stuff we're going to print out and all that. So if you want to come to the uh, Bible Institute, there's no charge. And uh, it'll be on Monday nights, every other Monday night from uh, 6 till 8, or I'm sorry, 6 till 8, 6 till 7. We may go a little over, but if, you, if you're interested in that, I need to know. I need you to sign up. I'll leave the paper right up here on the uh, communion table. And I think that's all uh, we need to mention. So uh, let's go to our, our Sunday school lesson. It has to do with having me have some of the young people up here, Brother. Mario's voice is on the edge. Seems to be uh, something I'm plagued with every vacation Bible school. Uh, the fellow that's leading is, has loses his voice right before the uh, right before the uh, vacation Bible school. So I've got a lesson for you. How many do not have a lesson? Because I've got some blanks to fill in. Okay, uh, really, you get to, how many do not do not have a lesson? Have to have one. There's one. Who else? One? Okay, it'll be the same as last year. 
Uh, for you, for you folks that haven't been here, uh, I have heard it preached, and I think I took a took a, a little survey. How many have heard a preacher preach that uh, Jesus or the Bible preaches more about hell than it does about heaven? How many have heard something similar to that? Well, I've got some information for you. If you're going to go according to the Bible. The word heaven or heavens is mentioned uh, over s almost 700 times in the Bible. Hell is mentioned 55. Does that sound like a preaching more on hell than in heaven? Doesn't to me. Uh, destruction is mentioned some, and there's other words that are used for hell or for heaven. But the phrase in heaven, I mean that's pretty, pretty specific. In heaven is used in the Bible 99 times. So, yes, there's much negative in the Bible, and yes, hell is a place to be shunned, and heaven is a place to be gained, but uh, I don't think God wants us to live our whole lives in fear of hell. And now, I'm glad I'm, I'm not going to hell, amen? amen. And that's why I got saved. But uh, what's motivating me now uh, to live for God is not necessarily not going to hell. What's motivating me is because I'm looking at what's on the other side. Right. So heaven or heaven is mentioned almost 700 times. And the phrase in heaven, which I think is important, you ought to circle that, number three, is used 99 times. In heaven, in heaven, in heaven. Uh, there are three men who saw heaven on from the earth and wrote something about it. The first one is Stephen in Acts chapter 7. Uh, and the second one is Paul the Apostle in 2 Corinthians 12. And the third is John the Beloved in the book of Revelation. Uh, now heaven, and, and this, is, this is important. Uh, let's go, we talked about Stephen last week in, in uh, Acts chapter 7. And let me just say this, if you if you got a new lesson and you didn't get it filled in. Stephen saw heaven. This is your blank in Roman number one, the middle of the page. Stephen saw heaven. He was preaching and he overcame suffering is the blank. He overcame suffering by keeping his eyes on heaven. Uh, it's one of the most unique uh, martyrdoms we've seen, but it, and uh, if you'll read Fox's Book of Martyrs, there are others that had similar situation. He was full of the Holy Ghost. He is described as falling asleep, which doesn't register to me as a martyr. Uh, but looking to heaven, we had mentioned, will help you, and three things I've got here particularly, will help you overcome suffering. It will give you the encouragement. I don't know how many times I talked. In fact, I talked to somebody yesterday, and they said, we're looking forward to heaven. It's an older person, of course. We're looking forward to heaven. Yeah. Uh, and uh, thank God for that. It'll give you encouragement, and it ought to give you some conviction. Remember Isaiah saw heaven? He glimpsed up into heaven? Yeah. And I'll mention this maybe earlier. He wasn't high five to Jesus. He was, uh, woe is me, I'm undone. So seeing heaven, uh, because I've heard it said, boy, if we could get one glimpse of hell, it'd change our lives, we'd be great soul winners. Well, these guys saw heaven, and it really motivated their lives. Yeah. So there's, there's great conviction when you see what's in heaven. I think it's so magnificent beyond the human comprehension. It takes the Holy Ghost to even comprehend Anything. There's heaven is so great, so massive, so blessed. And one of the things that I, I I'm, I'm concerned about is that people think heaven is I'm going to sit around in a lawn chair drinking iced tea and listen to the angels strum a harp. No way. No. That would be good for about an hour or so. And then you'd be bored to tears. Uh, that is not what heaven is. There's a whole list. He said there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. What did he do when he made the first heaven and the first earth? What was, what was, the, what was the Garden of Eden like? Uh, what was the work that God had Adam to do? What is the work he's going to have with the angels? And, the, and the, we, I'm, I'm jumping ahead to the description of the, of the tree of life and the, and the 12 trees and the, and the throne and the, head, the, the, the uh, 
New Jerusalem that comes down from God out of heaven and hangs suspended in the air, and the, the earthly Jerusalem, and all that's going to go on uh, with all those things, streets of gold, uh, 12 gates for entrance, and it's just so, so much going on. Uh, we are not going to be sitting around bored. In fact, you know, this is kind of a sarcastic comment from me. I think probably the first thousand years of the millennium, God's going to have a, have a bunch of uh, folks uh, have to go to Sunday school so they can relearn their Bible. <laughs> because they don't know their Bible very good right now. Uh, they're going to meet folks like, uh, uh, <coughs> excuse me, like Mephibosheth. Or meet folks like uh, uh, like Naaman, or uh, meet folks in the Bible, and they say, "Hey, boy, good. Did you read about me in the Bible? What's your name? I don't know. I don't remember that. You mean you had the Bible and you didn't read that? I think God's gonna. Uh, they have a bunch of uh, old grandmothers. One fellow said, teaching these other folks and, and these doctors and and the Greek teachers, and teach them about the Bible. Yeah. Amen." I've got a, I don't know if it's this week or next week. I think it's this week in the bulletin. Oh, yes. What could a 12-year-old boy teach the doctors? Well, Jesus was 12 years old, and he amazed the doctors. What could a 12-year-old teach a doctor? Well, you teach him who the promised Messiah was. You teach them that he died for the sins of the world. You teach them that the only hope for the world was Jesus, not the rituals. He could tell them that uh, the great physician is the one that could heal them. And teach them to look to the book for help. A child, listen to me now, a child who is saved and reads his Bible... comes from a consistent Christian home where they read their Bible. Oh, don't get me started. Go send your kids to school where they're going to be taught that you can, they can't mention God. They can't mention creation. They can talk all about evolution in billions and billions of years. And uh, so what, what, uh, what basis do they have for their uh, for, for a moral standard or for a standard to live right. The Ten Commandments, what I'm talking about. Well, they don't have it. It's your opinion. Some people think this is good. Some people think that's good. We, 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 you have no standard if you don't have God. And that's why we got this crazy mess out there in society the way we do. That's right. A child who is saved and reads his Bible knows more than most of the world. Yeah. I mean that. I'm not just, I'm not just, this is not some preacher's statement. Uh, he could teach a doctor that God created the world. Yeah. A lot of doctors don't know that. He could teach how Jesus answers prayer when medicine doesn't work. Right. Right. How many of our kids have prayed for some of our folks, including me, in this uh, church, and they got healed uh, when the doctor didn't know they could get healed or not? Teach how God answers prayer. He can teach how Jesus loved the world and died on the cross for our sins. And that's what's wrong with men. And that's why our bodies are falling apart. Uh, listen, God uh, had Paul write that God chose the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. So let your kid listen, that's why I said I have a family left here. Uh, they were coming and I said it's a sin to keep your kids out of Sunday school. I think it is. If you have a Sunday school available mm -hmm. and you don't, you, you got something else for your kids to do, so what? You got a 45 minute service or maybe another one if you just happen to go to two a week to overcome how many hours of TV? Mm -hmm. How many hours on the internet? How many hours on the phone? Yeah, oh, but they're going to get a lot of teaching at home too, right? No. If that's the, if that's their life, uh, you're going to you're going to try to overcome everything the world has to throw at you for a 45 minute service, folks. We're we're missing something here. Good. 
Uh, we're missing something. I'm, I'm trying to get back to heaven. You've got me off on this. Uh, there are three areas described as heaven. Well, let's go to let's go to Second Corinthians chapter twelve. Now, I mentioned and, and uh, we've already talked a little bit about Stephen seeing heaven and helped him overcome suffering. And uh, Roman numeral two down at the. Uh, bottom of the page, if you want to get this filled in before we start reading, Paul saw heaven after preaching, was stoned and overcame difficulties in, in his life. We're going to go to the passage, so we're going to 2 Corinthians 12, and then we're going to go back to Acts chapter 14. So 2 Corinthians chapter 12, let's read what Paul writes to the Corinthian church about heaven. He said, it is not expedient for me, doubtless, to glory. In other words, I can't, I can't glory over this. If any of the rest of us are the typical uh, TV preacher did this, he'd be selling books and, and videos and doing interviews with uh, uh, wicked men uh, about what he saw. By the way, let me just throw this out there for free. Don't tell me you went to heaven and saw what heaven was like and you came back to life. Every one of those testimonies that I have read in books, I've read a couple in books and seen a couple on the internet, what they described heaven like was not what the Bible said. Right. Amen. They come up with some uh, uh, some uh, human, uh, uh, so, some nice dream some human had uh, and said they saw heaven and God sent them back with a message. No, he's already sent back Jesus with a message sure. and uh, we, we, don't need, we don't need another message. By the way, while I'm on that subject, you get me off on all kinds of things today. Those pictures, they always show Jesus, and I see them and think about them the same thing too. That was not made by a Bible-believing Christian. No. Right. It was made by a Roman Catholic person. Generally, they had Jesus with light brown or reddish hair, and uh, he doesn't even look like a Jew, right. and he looks like an effeminate person, and uh, that is not what Jesus looks like. Right. No, not at all. He never looked like that. And I know for certain that he doesn't look like that in heaven. That's right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Say, why is that? Because I have a pretty detailed description in yeah, right. Revelation chapter 1. Uh -huh. The eyes is a flame of fire, and the feet is fine brass, and a, a two-edged sword out of his mouth. And when John the Beloved, who saw Jesus on the earth, saw him in heaven, he fell on his feet as dead. That's right. That was, that was the, the picture. And this... This effeminate Jesus that they show everywhere is not the Jesus of the Bible. Uh, now, he was a man here on this earth, and we don't know how he looked, but he must have looked like a Jew. In most of all the movies they have of Jesus, he's not a Jew. <laughs> or doesn't look like one, not a typical Jew. Uh, anyway. So, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, I'm talking about what they, they claim they see in heaven, what they claim when they saw Jesus. Uh, it, you know all that amounts to is self-glorification. Glorifying yourself and lifting yourself up, selling books and going on talk shows and all that kind of stuff. That's, that's not what God's interested in. God did not want people to see heaven and go around and go on talk shows. He wants us as born-again Christians to preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, this is the second man we have that saw heaven and it tremendously affected his life. He said, it is not expedient for me, doubtless to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. He's going to describe himself here. He says, I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth such an one caught up to the third, third, third heaven. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. 
uh, he's, he's in some kind of a state, uh, but he sees this vision. How that he was caught up into paradise, third heaven, and heard unspeakable words, which this is not lawful for a man to utter. In other words, God would not let him even write about it or glory in it. Of such an one will I glory, talking about Jesus, yet of myself I will not glory, but in my infirmities. Boy, how does that run against this, this health and wealth gospel? You just live for God and everything's going to be wonderful. And Paul dealt with illness most of his life. For though I would, verse 6, for though I would desire to glory, should who wouldn't? I shall not be a fool, for I will say the truth, but now uh, I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. Oh, John, God, listen, did you hear about Paul? He got to go to heaven. He got to see heaven. Did you see that? Oh, wow, isn't that wonderful? He got, he got to, that's not, that's not what God wants to glorify. He wants to glorify the Lord Jesus. And lest any man should think of Paul more than he should, because he saw a vision. In fact, wasn't it Peter that said, we saw Jesus manifested on the Mount of Trans? He said it in his yeah. letter. He said, we saw, we heard him speak, yeah. and yet we have a more sure word of prophecy than what I saw in the vision or what we saw. Yeah. Same with Paul. Uh, uh, it's not for him to, to glory in himself, uh, but I will glory in my infirmities, he said, uh, lest any man should think of me above. And Brother Jack, I remember when God sort of revealed this to me because we as preachers are good missionaries to Brother Gates. We're good at self-promotion. Well, we're going to do this, and well, we're going to do that, and boy, God did this in my life, and we're going to do that, and God's called me to do this, and God's called me to do that. And you know what Paul wrote of Jesus? He made himself of no reputation. reputation. And yet it seems like at Brother Gates, we're always trying to promote ourselves and give ourselves a reputation. We're trying to build a reputation and make ourselves look good. And Paul says, not me. I'm not trying to build a reputation. I'm trying to lift him up. Amen. It's not about me. It's not about my prayers. It's not about what I do. It's not about me. It's about him. It's about Amen. him. It's about him. It's not about what our church is doing. It's not about what Pastor Stahl has done. It's not about some other preacher at all. You heard it, Brother Jack. I mean, you hear this. Here's some guy getting ready to get, get up to preach. It sounds like he, he's better than Paul the Apostle. Oh, we are so honored to have this guy here. He's such a blessing. He's done so much for God. We're just, I can't believe we even got him here and we were able to get him. <laughs> like a one evangelist. Uh, one evangelist, or one guy who did evangelism. He required a first class seat. He yeah, required a first class seat. Yeah, I know. And you had to send him the ticket. Yeah. And it required a minimum of a thousand dollar offering. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. I mentioned some of you guys that know it. And I asked this one preacher, I said, well, why did these small churches have to I mean, a, a, a round trip, first class ticket, and a thousand dollars? Minimum? Of course, you got allowed to sell the books. I asked this preacher, I said, why do they, these preachers, they can't really afford this guy, these small churches. Why do they have them here? I said, well, there's people like them. And, you know, it gets, it gets, it gets some, uh, they, they bring people out because they like to hear him. He's a good speaker. You know, I've read, uh, Brother Gates, I've read some of the, the missionaries, William Carey and even uh, David or uh, David Livingston, other famous missionaries that we know about. You know, one of the things that's most amazing about Brother Jack, they said they were not impressive. I've, I've never met Ford Porter. I've heard about him. 
He wrote probably the most famous gospel track in the whole wide world. It's still being used. They said, you heard him preach? He really wasn't necessarily that great of us or a Torah preacher. You see, God's not in the business of lifting up men. He's in the business of lifting up his son, Jesus, Amen. and his word. So Paul says here, he said, lest any man should think of me above. I mean, we can raise Paul up to something amazing. Verse 7, so look what God gave him to make sure he did it. And lest I should be exalted above measure, which it would be easy to do. Or we can say a lot about Paul. Through the abundance of the revelation that was given to me. Boy, God gave Paul some amazing revelations about the body of Christ and the mystery uh, of godliness and the, 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 the New Testament and, and the, just all kinds of things God gave to him. He said, there was given to me. A gift was given to Paul. What, what was given to him? A thorn in the flesh. What? The messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. He gave me an affliction. Wasn't that wonderful? Boy, I've been praying to God. What did he give you? An affliction. Verse 8. I mean, Paul's the one who us a lot about praying. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice. He prayed about it. That it might depart from me. Lord, I could do a whole lot better job if you take this affliction from me. He said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee. His grace is sufficient for everything. Amen. His grace is sufficient for you and your family and your kids and your job and your salvation and everything that you have. His grace is sufficient. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. You know, I think I'll skip these verses. They don't seem very encouraging. No, we'll keep going. My strength is made perfect in weakness, so keep me weak, Lord. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities. Oh, no, 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 no. I don't want more infirmities. For what? That the power of Christ may rest upon me. Yeah. I think sometimes God keeps us in dire straits just so we'll stay close to him because if we were doing so well, we wouldn't. It's true. I mean, that, we're, we're typical flesh. Things go good, we forget about God. Verse 10, Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities. Oh, Paul, you're whack, man. What do you mean you take pleasure in infirmities? In reproaches? No, I don't want folks to reproach me. Some folks that talk about me in necessities? Necessities? You mean you're going to do without things? What about my Cadillac? Yeah. What about your Cadillac? Well, Joseph and Mary didn't get one. You know what Joseph and Mary needed? To go to Bethlehem and not have a place to stay. Well, Brother Gates, I can hear it now. Oh, it's so difficult. Uh, what are they doing to me? But then I didn't have a place to stay. We had to sleep in our car. It was terrible. Have you ever slept in your car? Most missionaries have. Did he complain about it then? We need necessities. And, and Joseph and Mary needed to not have a place. They needed to wind up having a baby and putting him in a manger. And having a bunch of shepherds attend the, the birth. They needed to have that need. Uh, so God could take care of them and show his, his mighty grace and mercy to them. He said that I, I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches in necessities. God wants you in need. You need to be in need. In persecution. Let's skip that one. In distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Amen. Boy, there's a lot in there. I don't have time to cover all that, but I'm simply saying that Paul, God took Paul to the third heaven. 
Now let's go to some scriptures. We went at these before, but I want to let you look at them again. Psalm 148. Let's go to that one first. We're talking about heaven. Paul saw heaven, and it motivated him to overcome difficulties in life. Heaven is mentioned far more in the Bible than hell. Kingdom of heaven. Uh, psalm 148. It's a great psalm. By the way, I think I've got this. Brother Jack, you're preaching tonight, right? You uh, won't be good. Is that a yes or a no? Uh, yeah. Are you preaching? Did I, have, did I just get you to preach tonight? I don't know, brother. Uh, I mean, I've got the message already going. I thought I, I couldn't remember what day I asked you to preach. I probably did. I'll talk to you for the service. Psalm 148. Now this is also the psalm that says God sends bad weather. Verse 8. Fire. Whoa, 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 whoa. Hail, snow, vapor. Remember when the power went out Wednesday? You know what they said? How, how, what, how the power went out here Wednesday? Lightning bolt struck the the telephone pole. Well, whose fault was that? I know it's that dumb weather man who did that. <laughs> Fire and hail and snow, verse 8, vapor, stormy wind, fulfilling his word. That's, that's another thing. All right, Psalm 140, we're talking about heaven. Praise ye the Lord. It's one of the last, the whole last part of the book of the Psalms is praise. Praise ye the Lord from the heavens, plural, heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him, all ye angels. Praise him, all ye hosts. That's the armies, the angels. Verse 3. Praise ye him, sun and moon. Praise him, all ye stars of light. Praise him, ye heavens of heavens, and ye waters that be above the heavens. Now remember Paul? He said he was caught up into the one, two, three, third heaven. So we know there's more than one heaven here. And if you'll go back, there's, and there's this body of water, we call it the Crystal Sea in, in the Revelation chapter 4. Uh, we sing about, I'm, I'll stand beside the Crystal Sea. That, that frozen body of water that's up there in heaven with the fire on it. I had to draw pictures of that when I uh, uh, went through my... Uh, uh, classes in, in Revelation a year or so ago, and I had to draw a picture of every chapter of the book of Revelation. One of them was, wow, the fire on the, on the, on the body of frozen water in heaven. Uh, it's pretty, pretty spectacular, uh, just from my imagination. So there's heavens above, there's three heavens. So let's go to Genesis chapter 1 briefly, and uh, let's see if we can learn something uh, about the heavens. Genesis 1 1 in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth and the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep and the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters not the waters on the earth and God said let there be light and there was light and God saw the light that it was good and God divided the light from the darkness God called the light day and the darkness he called night and the evening and the morning were the first day Verse 6, and God said, let there be a firmament. This is an expanse, a space. In the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. Not horizontally, vertically. Divide the waters from the waters, verse 7, which were above, oh, look at verse 7. And God made the firmament. And divided the waters which were under, talking vertical, not, not horizontal, the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. The firmament, what's this firmament? And God called the firmament heaven. Heaven is in between these waters. Not the clouds, the body of waters. Not clouds that have water, we're talking about a body of water. 
God called the firmament heaven in the evening and the morning were the, were the second day. Uh, and God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear in so. That's the waters on the earth. Okay. Uh, then look in verse number 17. We're talking about another description of the firmament. Verse 17 of chapter 1. And God set them in the firmament, talking about the, uh, the greater and the lesser light, the, the uh, sun and the moon. Set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. Okay, let me go to one more scripture. Let's go to Job 35. I don't think I have these listed. Uh, this is back up in your introduction. Uh, number four, three areas described as heaven, the sky, the solar system, the stars, and the head of God's throne, where the crystal sea is. All right? Job 35, look in verse 5. So uh, what we're talking about heavens, we're talking about what you should see in the sky with your normal eye. The second heaven, which is all the stars, the planets, the stuff you can't even see millions of miles out there. And then the third heaven is where God is. By the way, they're all real places. Now just because at heaven... Where, where God is, is a real place where you're really going to go and you're really going to be able to see. It's a real place. So he says here, in, in, uh, there's a lot of such great description, science description in the book of Job, one of the best science books in the world. Uh, by the way, let me throw this out for free, whatever it's worth. The Bible never contradicts true science. Don't you right. ever forget that. I heard this. Well, the Bible's not a science book. Oh, yes, it is. In fact, he warns us, warned Paul, warned Timothy, to beware of science falsely so-called. Right. Science, science, science. Like, this is, this is scientific, but if you believe the Bible, you're not scientific. No, if you want true science, you believe what the Bible says. Right. The Bible is way ahead of inventors uh, on, on, on any given number of subjects. They just didn't see it. Uh, chapter 35, verse 5. Look into the heavens, plural, and see, and behold, the clouds which are higher than now. Again, it's another description of the uh, first and second heaven. And uh, so you got the sky, the solar system above the heaven, and the third heaven where God's throne is. Let's go read about that one. Now go to Revelation chapter 4. Do you see why it's so interesting to read your whole Bible, not just the New Testament? And let me say this, I, there are some, and I understand it, that don't like to mark in their Bible. If you don't mark in your Bible, at least have a journal or a notebook. I mark in my Bible because I say, oh, wow. And anything that deals with heavens, I, I refer it back to either Genesis chapter 1 or uh, Revelation chapter 4. So whenever I get something about heavens, I can, and I jot them down in the margin. I know you have a center column, but I've got a lot of references that are not in the center column. I use the center column in mine. I have a Cambridge Bible, and uh, we pass out Schofield Bibles. The set of the references and the notes are not perfect. They're not inspired by God, but the text is. You understand that? Schofield wasn't inspired by God. I think he has a lot of good stuff, and some stuff's not so good. With any writer. That guy like that one preacher, he said, I hold all books in suspicion except for one. Amen. The Bible. The Bible. King James Bible. So, Revelation chapter 4. Oh, yeah. The first three chapters deal with, with uh, John seeing the, uh, uh, seeing the churches and seeing Jesus. And uh, I, I'm going to go over, maybe next week, I'll go over the outline of the second coming because I, it's laid out in Revelation. It's so simple. Mm -hmm. And I have to have it simple. If it's complicated, I can't get it. All right? Revelation chapter 4. This is John, the beloved, the one who leaned on Jesus Christ. By the way, back up two chapters just to give you an idea. Uh, look at verse 9. We're talking about heaven now and things we see. Here's John, who was banished to an island by himself. He was being, being punished by the Roman government. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos. 
for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. I think he was in the spirit on, on the day of the Lord and also the day of the week. Saying, verse 11, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, what thou seest write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia. He mentions the seven churches. Verse 12, and I turned to see the voice that spake with me and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. Uh, after he mentioned the churches, Verse 13, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks was one likened to the Son of Man. Well, John, I thought you spent a lot of time with the Son of Man. You know, he's seen him different than he ever saw him. Right. Clothed with a garment down to the foot. I guess he didn't have shorts on. Uh, never mind. And girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool. As white as snow, his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like undefined brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. That's pretty powerful, isn't it? You ever been around Niagara Falls? You ever been around the ocean? You can't get within a mile of Niagara Falls, and I'm the, the place just roars. Uh, he said, uh, verse 16, and he had in his right hand seven stars. And out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. I mean, this is a pretty scary being. This will be any of those cartoon characters and, and uh, superheroes. Can I hear amen? Amen. And, uh, boy, teach your kids about this stuff. Don't let them learn all the stuff about Batman and, and all that junk. Uh, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. Could you look at him? No, you couldn't look at him. He's too bright. And when I saw him, this is John, who leaned on Jesus' breast, heard his heartbeat, ate with him, slept with him. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. That's the effect that seeing Jesus in heaven had on John the Beloved. Pretty powerful, isn't it? And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. Now, let's go to what John sees here in chapter 4. Because he's kind of like Paul. He doesn't want he's in the spirit, in the body, out of the body. Revelation chapter 4. Talking about heaven now. And this I look and behold a door was opened in heaven. You're going to find that phrase in chapter 19 and verse 11 and it cuts the, the, the book of uh, Revelation into, into, into different sections. It's very important. So heaven is open, and the first voice which I heard were as of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show you things which must be hereafter. Sounds much like Jesus coming in the clouds and the voice of the trumpet, the voice of the archangel and the trump of God. That all the saints are going to hear. Not the whole world. Not the whole world's going to hear. He's coming as a thief in the night. Verse 2. And immediately I was in the spirit. And behold a throne was set in heaven. And one sat on the throne. And, the, and he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. There was a rainbow round about the throne. We're going to stop right there. We'll pick up on this next week. We see a half rainbow or a double half rainbow. I believe in heaven we're going to see a 360 degree Amen. rainbow. Uh, so remember the glory of God. And it'll have nothing to do with these perverts. Amen. I uh, hope that helps you a little bit about heaven. And it's a place to look forward to. It's exciting. It's where I'm going. And if you're saved, it's where you're going. Amen. And I, I'm excited every time I hear about it. I hope it helps you. And listen, we want to tell others about Jesus because that's where they want to go. That's right. Not to hell. All right. God bless you. Let's get ready for the morning service. Thank you for the